Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to our special topic webinar on pest prevention. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Please, everyone, mute your line. I've taken care of that on the back end, but if somehow you become unmuted, please mute yourself. You can use the chat box to ask any questions, and all questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. For any additional questions, concerns, or comments that you didn't get a chance to ask, you can email them to education at nola.gov. And for this webinar, there are no CEUs being offered for Louisiana sanitarians. Next year, here, Dr. Mike Mark Janowicki introduce our, to the, our speaker today. Okay, thank, thank you. So we're, we're lucky to have Janet Hurley today. Um, Janet Hurley has her bachelor's degree in community health from Texas uh, Women's University and a master's in public affairs from the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, Janet has worked for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension for over 20 years, running the Texas School um, Integrated Pest Management Program. That there, her position includes um, assisting school districts with their IPM programs, but she also helps coordinate the training efforts at the IPM Experience House uh, located at that um, research and education center. Beyond just Texas, uh, Janet's known for her work on the National School IPM Work Group, which helps coordinate efforts among states to offer quality training and education to those interested in IPM. Janet has also been a long-standing committee member of the International IPM Symposium and has been co-chair of their awards committee. We are very privileged to have her um, join us virtually today to present on, on pest prevention. Uh, so Janet, go ahead. Um, the floor is all yours. All righty. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for uh, hanging out with us. Um, I will say to those in Texas, because I have special um, permission, you can get CEU credits, um, drop Astasia a note or put something in the chat to let her know if you're a Texan, because we do have blanket approval. Um, so without further ado, let me get started about pest prevention and how you can use assessment-based inspection to prevent pests in your living and working space. Um, let me move this. And before I get started, I do want to make sure everybody understands that anything you see in, in this presentation as far as products or brand names or trade names or anything like that, this is all for educational purposes. I do not endorse or promote one thing or another. A lot of times I use um, images to help illustrate a point. So our objectives today are really to help you, the individual, even if you own a home or rent, live in an apartment, uh, you know, you travel a lot, whatever, to be able to either prevent or recognize things that could be conducive for when pests might be able to thrive. Part of that thrive, that ability to su succeed is brought on by us as being humans and sometimes you know we can rectify our own problems and then sometimes you know even the best of us myself has to call in a professional to you know get something done so it's understanding you know what can i do myself and when do I need to recognize to bring in, you know, the, the guys on the, the horses, you know, the cavalry. So looking at homes, it doesn't matter where you live. It, it doesn't matter if you live in the north. It doesn't matter if you live in the south, east, west. Um, something that is multifamily, something that is perceived even historic, you know, it doesn't matter where you dwell. There is a propensity to have pests, even things like spiders, simply because it is a convenient place for them to gather. So our best offense is a defense. 
And the best way to do that is understanding what are you up against and what could be considered a real problem and what are things just to be aware of. I mean, if you've got rodents and you know they're prevalent in your area, knowing about that and making sure that your dwelling's not conducive for them, that's great. Bed bugs and deer ticks, if they're not in your dwelling, the only way they're gonna come is by you interacting outside of your dwelling and coming in contact with them. And then from everything else, from termites to ants, to roaches, to flies, to lady beetles, it all depends on um, living situations, what's going on, and mother nature plays a big factor in all types of pests. But the one thing that everything needs, it doesn't matter if I'm an icky cockroach or if I am a squirrel or if I'm human, I need food, water, and harborage to survive. However, for me being a pest, ant, roach, even termite, flies, those little guys need something small small like a credit card. So they don't need, you know, 1,500 square feet. They may need 15 centimeters. So understanding food. If I'm a cockroach, yeah, um, crumbs, debris, grease, uh, things that, you know, fall behind the, the stove, the refrigerator. That is all ample food for a mere little cockroach and maybe even food for a mouse. Water. While every pest may not need to ingest water daily like we do as humans, they do need that water and or that moisture to sustain themselves. It's just a matter of the level of it. For instance, cockroaches, again, because they are somewhat waterphilic, but also because their body, their ectoskeleton, needs that moisture, well, then they're going to be hanging around areas where they're going to get more moisture than a dry desert. So some of the most important pests around your dwelling come in various shapes and sizes but termites which this is what they look like when they're getting ready to mate you know look vastly different they look somewhat similar to this um, fly larvae but I mean they're very small they're very cryptic powder post beetles pop up in little wood well this is the size of a dime the size of those holes are like the size of a tip of a pencil. Carpenter ants, rice, excuse me, mice and rats, squirrels, other wildlife, honeybees, honeybees and yellow jackets getting into wall voids and living between your walls and your attics. That could be dangerous. Um, certain species of ants, not just um, carpenter ants, but Argentine ants, some of the tawny crazy ants, can also be problematic. Then there's fire ants, which also sting. German cockroaches, which is what this roach is up here on the right, they're known to transmit a lot of foodborne illnesses. And bed bugs just on itself is just a 100% creep factor. So understanding that, you know, one or two of these, maybe not that big of a deal, but I've got news for y'all. Any of this that come, crosses the threshold at my house, I'm, I'm all about eliminating. But let's talk about this. So most pests can be prevented. You just have got to know what steps to prevent certain pests. I live in North Texas. So the the home that I am dwelling in has been my, my mom bought the house in 89. 
I've lived in it. She's lived in it. But because it's a little bit older and because I do live in an area where rodents are prevalent, mosquitoes are prevalent, fire ants, odorous house ants, cockroaches, there's termites, there's lots of things. So even as someone who can empathize with you all, what do I do to manage this? Well, again, when I um, moved back in that house several years ago, I had a few things. So I had to look at how do I prevent? And it's not was not just putting out pesticides. I had to do some human controls. But I needed to understand what I was up against. And I needed to understand that, it, again, if it doesn't come in a can and kills bugs dead, what do I need to do or hire others to do to help me remedy my problems? Because it's not just how do I do um, prevention? It's achieving those maximum results. So prevention could be looking at the exterior of the home. Do I have too much vegetation? Monitoring. How do I walk around and assess? What about my attic space? What about storage space? Identification, understanding what I'm actually dealing with and then doing my routine maintenance and then keeping good records. I mean, it doesn't matter where you live, but especially if you are owning your own home, y'all, even when in a hot sales market, people are going to want to know, what did you do? Has there been any problems? That type of thing. And bless all our hearts, if you just decide to be there for more than 10, 15, 20 years, sometimes it, you'll be surprised how quick time flies. So integrated pest management is problem solving. And what I mean by that is to know what you are dealing with means you really got to be more like a Sherlock Holmes, a detective, somebody who you're trying to figure out what's going on. Because what you need to do is prevent or stop pests. Like I said, it doesn't matter really what, what kind of insect pest it is or mammal. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that no matter what it is, I'm not going to let them through that threshold. But to do that, part of it is inspections and monitoring, walking my perimeter, making sure that, you know, there's not ways for, for especially mammals to get in, knowing what I've got. Now, granted, I, I've got a little bit more knowledge than most, but I also know how to use the internet. I know that I've got county extension agents. I also know there's way to find resources. I just don't guess. And then depending on what I'm dealing with, and say I was dealing with um, ants in my kitchen and I called my apartment manager, but are there things I need to do? Making sure, you know, I spill up the spilled coffee and the creamer. You know, making sure that, you know, every now and then I do go through and vacuuming stuff and then make sure that whatever I did myself, maybe even my pest control company, if it didn't work, why didn't it work? So the basics of IPM is reduction. Reduction being exposed to pests, exposure to pesticides, because again, chemicals don't help us as humans, but they can be off, often overused um, with pests in the home. Making sure that we drop our indoor allergens, which can be correlated to both the pests and the pesticides, and then making sure we have a clean living environment. I mean, we see it on TV, people talk about it, but the truth is, I mean, the less cluttered, the, the more relaxed our lifestyle is, the simply it's the better off our mind is. So how does IPM improve all this? Well, 
human and environmental health. Basically, when you're preventing pests and pesticides being inside a dwelling, that means that dwelling air, that ventilation, which is extremely important nowadays, is, is free from a lot of external allergens. When I talk about stress within family or the work organization, some pests, mosquitoes, bed bugs, rodents, cockroaches, spiders, Human nature is not to like them. Therefore, sometimes folks add an additional stressor to something that can be introduced from the outside. And really, one little stressor can sometimes upset the apple cart. Like I said, indoor air quality. Indoor air quality can't be stressed enough because, again, talking about... Um, Cockroach or mouse allergens, both, dust, any of that is known asthma triggers. We know that. So keeping that stuff down to a minimum inside your, your living environment and your work, because, I mean, some, some of us, heaven forbid you're working from home, that means 24 hours in the same place, but sometimes even, you know, moving from work to home and home to work, sometimes, again, what is that indoor air quality like? Because, again, if I'm healthy and I'm comfortable, my productivity and my outlook on life is better. Swear. So pesticides. It's an interesting thing because these are good and bad all in the same invention. I mean, when pesticides were invented cleaning products they're considered a pesticide i mean some of the things that we invented back during um world war one and two were revolutionary as far as eliminating a lot of things however as time has gone by there are some percep perceptions on some pesticides that can be harmful but at the same time, what we've also learned, overuse can also have some problems. So trying to figure out where we all balance on what is a pesticide, how are we exposed to it, and then understanding what we're going to do with this chemical if we've got a problem. Because envisioning a better way than hey, it comes in a can and it kills bugs dead. Some folks don't realize some of the simplest things you can do is sanitation, decluttering, and cleaning. Believe it or not, that myth that, that products can come in a can and spray and kill bugs and or weeds dead is great, but what we have really learned over time, especially in the last 10 to 20 years is pests become resistant and or tolerant of what is being used. Therefore, sometimes what we are doing is making a bigger bug, a bug that probably didn't have a problem before become more resistant. And now we've got to worry about how do we fix this? So now we have to look at well, what are we doing and how are we doing it? Are we going to make sure that risk from exposure may outweigh the benefit of killing all pests? Because with DDT, for example, using that product, we realized it killed good bugs, bad bugs, and every bug in between. We are still having some problems with some chemicals today. Side effects to pets and wildlife. Improper use of rodenticides, especially by consumers, by just tossing things out without putting them in tamper-resistant containers, has been very um, detrimental to not only um, cats, dogs, but other mammals that possibly did not mean to be harmed, but somebody was trying to get rid of one thing and harmed another. And then 
we've got to be real careful when we're using pesticides around our older generation, our children, um, childbearing women, and especially if they are pregnant. And then if you have health concerns like asthma or COPD, and then there are folks that do have chemical sensitivities. They may not have had that sensitivity when they were younger, but as they get older, and let me just tell you all, after 50, especially when you're a female, things can go a little bit wonky with, you know, hormonal changes. So don't discount some of this stuff as, oh, that's just made up. It may not be because again, we don't, just because we think we know a lot about the body, we really don't. One of the other things we do as, as consumers is we think we can solve the problem again and we'll go to the store and we'll buy one of these total release foggers. We call them bug bombs. And as these images show you, yeah, this happens a lot. Because one of these cans is good for generally at least a thousand square foot. And when you're talking about small homes or apartments, and again, depending on how the ventilation is, they can build up pressure and you thought you were getting rid of the bugs, but instead you got rid of your home instead. So let's talk about how to pest get in the home. All right, first things first, you've got a dwelling and it doesn't matter what it really looks like, but you've got vegetation because we all want trees around our property because trees help with keeping out the hot sun. They help with making our property look nicer. You know, we all like trees. So do birds, rats, squirrels, and a lot of other things, even ants will use trees. How much planting do we have around? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's, I've got a planter box or I've got lots of vegetation or I've got a climbing vine, you know, what do I have? Where is it? How close is it to my foundation? Is there anything that can help disrupt it? All right, where did you get stuff? It doesn't matter if it's, Oh, look, the neighbor put out this cool looking recliner and I need it. Or I've gone to the big box store or I went, I'm a flea market, you know, flipper, whatever it is. This is all human. Humans do all of this. The the pests just take advantage of how we manipulate the environment. So when we're talking, and my, my, my day gig is really helping schools with their pest control programs, but when I'm talking to them or a, an institution like a hospital or a nursing home, or even a coworker about getting rid of rodents around their house, I tell everything, everybody, it's the building envelope. How do you seal this up? Because if they can't get in and if you can thwart them, that's the first step. So as a homeowner, we're ideally suited, but again, we could become our own enemy. This probably looked really great when it was installed 20 years ago. And typically what happens, especially when you get to be my age and then my parents' age, is as you get older, you don't have the wherewithal to get in here and cut this back. But it's also things have changed and we've learned. You know, we might not want to, you want them as close to our house anymore. I might want something low and easy to maintain. Yeah, flowers, but I don't have to get out there and do a whole lot of work with it. So understanding, because three-fourths, and the reason I say all of this, if I cannot see the brick 
or my veneer or whatever my exterior part of my home looks like, especially at ground level, then how the heck do I know that I don't have termites, rodents, or ants? And that's just the first three. So inspection becomes something that you do. You walk your perimeter. Then what comes in? Yeah, I love to go um, garage sailing or doing the flea market stuff. But I also know because of what I do, things aren't just going to miraculously come in with me. It may be out. I may store it out in an out shed so that if there's something on it, it gets out there where I'm not too worried about something. Is it something that, you know, I've inherited unboxing it outside rather than bringing it in? Because again, maybe you have a storage bin and you've got stuff there, but you go and you pick up your five boxes that you're going to use or it's your um, Easter decorations or if, you know, if you're from Louisiana, you probably pulled out your Mardi Gras decorations. But whatever it is, you know, before bringing it in, because, again, German cockroaches, carpet boxes, paper bags, anything like that, silverfish. I mean, there's lots of creepy things that come in with with cardboard. So you want to make sure that what you're doing bringing stuff all the way in or on the exterior perimeter that you're keeping things neat and clean. So then I hear from folks who um, live in apartments. Oh, I can't do anything. Oh, I'm all right, people. I realize that not every one of us is John the maintenance guy, but these doors, even though they may be in a vestibule or someplace else. If I can stick quarters or worse, this screwdriver and or one of my fingers underneath the door, so can a cockroach, so can a beetle, so can a cricket, so can a mouse. Would I like to have really good door sweeps like this? Yeah, but if you can't, if all you can do is put one of the ones that, that's that got more like weather stripping, but you can put it on the inside to at least keep some of the crawling pests out, y'all, that's better than nothing. The other thing is weather stripping. If you can see daylight, so can bugs. And what I mean by that is, a lot of our flying insect, moss, beetles, um, crickets, even grasshoppers, can be attracted to some type of light. Well, if there is lighting above a door on the exterior, and then depending if it's a vestibule door or the back door to, to the school cafeteria, there's lighting. Insects can pick up on some of that UV light and use that as an attractant. So when we're talking again, it's not just down here on the threshold, it's side here, it's windows. You wanna make sure that, be it a crane fly or be it a mosquito, is not coming in and living with you because you couldn't fix the screen. And you decided it was such a pretty day I'm going to open the windows, let the fresh air in, and I do that. I have got wicked bad allergies, but y'all, getting sometimes that stale air out of the house and that fresh air of blowing in, and especially if there's a fragrant bush outside, you know, gardenia or roses or something like that. I mean, I might open a window, but I could also open a window with a little torn screen like that and the mosquitoes and the flies come in. They're not my friends. So again, looking at one's exterior, and when we're talking about, so this has got a couple of things that I, I, I wanna point out. One, 
Notice these bushes on the exterior of the house. They're, they're um, abelia bushes. They flower. They, they're kind of a rose variety. They're covering up what you can't see behind is the AC um, condenser. So you can't see the condenser from the street, but notice they're not right up against the house. Again, decorative but I can see because I need to be really mindful of the fact that I've got electrical wires and stuff that I know rodents and ants are going to be drawn to. Speaking of rodents, now you're looking at the garage door and a lot of times depending on the garage door and how it seals is depending on it may look flush on the front but what you might have a problem with on the inside of the garage that you cannot see from the exterior is just this wearing down pattern to where over the years, decades, decades, um, it just wears down and this becomes an easy place for rats to come in. So again, being mindful of, you know, if I'm worried about rodents and they're coming into my garage, then this would be an area I would need to fix. Keeping shrubs trimmed. Okay, this again, around the exterior of my perimeter, I can't see the termite tubes that were there. I cannot see what else is breeding here. So again, that might need to be cut back. Is this up against, and notice the vegetation on this school building. Something low here, yes, it's pretty, it will flower, but because it's up next to the building, it's not gonna be a big major attractant to certain things, especially probably bees and probably um, rodents. Okay, I've got vegetation out here, my trees are out here. These are gorgeous bushes, but they're being used as a hedgerow. There's nothing on one side or the other. And that's what makes these so beautiful. So understanding where do you plant it? What is it objective? And what, you know, I don't only want to be beautified because I don't care if it's an azalea or um, an oleander or, or a privet or a rose bush. Those are beautiful bushes, but again, parking up against a house versus using it as a, a barrier to maybe the alley or some other open space, great difference. Then again, humans on the inside. Remember I said cardboard is evil. It, unless I'm getting ready to move, and, and I've been known, yes, folks, if I know I'm having a move, I will collect cardboard. But the minute the move is done, cardboard deboxed, sent to recycling. Things like this, yes, we have all seen these episodes of, of hoarders. But at the same time, the more clutter, the worse, the harder it is to solve a pest problem. Even something like this is simple as, hey, this is the recycling bin, but if there is a lot of sugary substances here, and again, this is the handicap where I've got to roll up in my wheelchair and press this, and it's late summer, early fall, I may be greeted by a paper wasp, a honeybee, a yellow jacket, because this becomes a foraging area, so again, human behavior. These lovely things, all right, I'm going to be the best citizen in the world. I'm going to do all this great stuff around my house. I'm going to have a rain barrel for my rainwater, but I don't maintain it. And the screen rips. Then I've got mosquitoes breeding in here and it becomes really nasty here, and then I've got too many cockroaches over here. And mind you, my front door is, is right over here by the watering can. So now what, now what have you done? 
if you live in the South, if, if, if you're north of the Mason-Dixon line, I'm sorry, y'all, you may not be familiar with this, but this is called an AC compressor. And this is what I was hiding in at my house. But most of these compressors are on a concrete slab. Concrete slab may or may not be attached to the house or the foundation. And because there is copper water lines running from the house back and forth, this also becomes a place where, again, moisture can build up. Ants, um, especially fire ants, love these things. Um, rodents, rabbits, I've had all sorts of things, burrow, uh, yellow jackets. So again, making sure if you're doing your perimeter check once a quarter around your house, make sure that you can see around here. Make sure that, you know, you've got clear, clear angles because this is something and you don't want vegetation growing up on this because you want good airflow. All right, underneath the kitchen sink. Ever since I was a little girl, and that's been a few decades, uh, cleaning products have always been stored under the kitchen sink. Well, under the kitchen sink, is there's lots of other things that go under the kitchen sink besides cleaning products. You know, they make this invention called a, a garbage disposal. Without them, humans make a lot of more mess, but still, these can break. These can come undone. There's this electrical unit, the switch to generally power said garbage disposal for emergency shutoff. But all of this, there are two things in here that especially cockroaches love. Warmth for harborage and two, water. And you'd be surprised what they can do for food in here. Because this is what cabinets look like when you pull out everything. And what you'll see is all of that black goo, that is cockroach poop. Okay, I, I'm sorry if you're eating or weren't prepared for this. But this is stuff that we come across all the time. And if it's not cockroaches, I have seen mice. And if it's not mice, I've seen ants. And if it's not ants, I've seen termites. But these being, again, German cockroaches, and we know they're German by these two little racing stripes on them, whereas this is um, a smoky brown, but smoky browns and Americans, which look very similar, are the larger cockroaches. The Americans are the ones that kind of fly. Smoky brown are a little bit more slender in the body, but either one will come up out of the these um, floor drains under these excussion pl plates and hang out and then go back down and stuff and they do smell pretty nasty. So when we're talking about exclusion or cleaning, one of the best things if you don't own is some type of vacuum that has a wand that you can use to suck up stuff. My preference is some type of HEPA filter. Is if you get that, at least if you go around and do nothing but twice a year, vacuum around um, the edge of your ceiling where your wall and your, your ceiling comes together because a lot of your spiders like there. Then take that same wand, go down around your baseboards and especially doors and stuff and windows. The more you suck up, the, and especially if you hate spiders, this is your best friend, okay? The next is sealants. Now, granted, we're not all going to go around and fix our windows, and I got news for y'all. I live in North Texas, and foundation shift, which means window shift, which means door shift, but there comes a time when it's not just sticking in a credit card, but I can stick in the tip of a pen and get into this. Then I need to understand the difference. So caulks are rigid. When they're dried, um, they don't typically expand. Okay, so once you put a caulk out 
it's caulked, it's done. Sealants, which typically like silicone, are more flexible. You know, again, depending on the area, do you need the area to, to, to breathe, to move? I mean, some things do. FYI, you should be able to, I don't know if we can get you to that YouTube, but on the Texas School IPM website, there should be a video of Dr. Regal showing you the difference between cocks and sealants. All right. And so typically when we're talking cocks, especially around the house, the four that you will mostly see at you pick it, any hardware store, big box store, you know, even sometimes at your local um, convenience store bodega, you may find at least one of these. So latex, it's mostly acrylic. It's water based. Um, it's least expensive. Good for minor repairs, especially in kitchens and bathrooms. Okay, if you've got, you know, a sink and you can put your fingers or a credit card behind the sink and the kids spill and you don't want moisture going back on the backsplash, latex would probably be great. The next one, rubber. So these are synthetic compounds, generally things like um, nitrile and styrene, which you're familiar with for some on gloves and things like that. Generally, they will um, stick to almost everything, but can melt things like styrofoam, which is one of those things you do in science class. And then um, sometimes we'll work on damp or oily materials. They do stink. Rubber does have an, an, an odor to it, mostly because you're looking at things like the preens and the butadines, those en E's do tend to have some type of off-gassing on them, but again, can be used outdoors. Generally, it depends on what you're having to seal up, maybe a window or something like that. Polyurethane, again, it's an outdoor caulk. Windows, uh, joists, back porches, that's what I was trying to think of. And then there's silicone. If you're really doing something, you know, one thing is behind a sink, another it's your tub or your shower and you're using it day in, day out with water, you're going to want something that has something. Now, there's a product out there called Rodent Stop. And this Rodent Stop stuff is a little bit like a caulk, except for it also has some of this elastomeric material in it. That is what is in the center of this. So let's start from our right and we're gonna work left. First of all, expanding foam, if you will notice, it was nowhere on this list. That stuff can be very evil because expanding foam will do just that. It expands and especially if you're dealing with um, door joists, windows, and you're also having to, you think you're going to seal up for rodents and squirrels, forget it. They will chew through this. What we did for this particular um, patch was we took this um, excluder, which is, again, it's steel wool, and it's woven into a fabric that you can shove into holes and then I took the rodent stop, shoved that there so that the rats could not gnaw through it. Now, this is all kind of over the top, but I was trying to keep them out of a building. I'm worried about just keeping cockroaches coming out of the wall, the bathroom wall cabinetry. I can go down to my local dollar whatever store Again, um, get some Brillo pads or some copper mesh and use that to seal up this area. 
you could, I mean, if you tried sealant, caulk or something, you'd be sealing for days and it'd just go through the wall. Something like this and then foamed over it or sealed it over with some caulk, then yes, more than likely the, the pest won't come through because they're going to get the message you don't want them there. Door sweeps and weather stripping. Remember I was talking about those doorways and being able to see. You want to make sure that, again, if nothing else, even if you live in an apartment, you want to make sure you've got some type of door sweep that at least keeps the crawling pest from, from coming in. Maybe it's windows doing that or industrial-wise, that company that I was talking about that makes that material that's got the steel wool in it, this excluder, also makes door sweeps for industrial areas that makes it so that they cannot get in. So, how do you prevent? Well, if you see something, say something. I have news for y'all. I was saying that long before um, it became the popular statement, but it is the truth. People too often assume well, it's not my responsibility. I don't need to tell anybody. The problem with that is if everybody believed that, especially in an apartment complex, and you assume that the, the maintenance guy knows everything, really? Think about this in your own life. Do you, you know what's around in your surroundings, which you may see every day, but how often... Do you go to the post office? Okay, I mean, it's one of those things. Sometimes assuming gets us into so much trouble. So seeing something, like I said, you don't have to identify a pest, ant versus cockroach, but again, letting the office, front office know, hey, we noticed that there is something crawling up and down our stairs. They look like ants, but y'all need to know that. Oh, over by the dumpster, man, you should see the problem, but it looks like the dumpster's broken. All right. Like I said, our, in the United States, we have these things called cooperative extension, county offices. If you typically will Google or whatever search engine you use, Google Cooperative Extension County Office, something will come up or Department of Entomology in your state. There are ways to get you information to figure out what you're doing. And again, when we're only left with the evidence, I see some wings or something, it makes it really hard as a pest management professional to fix something if I've only got one piece of the story. You know, the he said, she said, and you've only got he, it's the same thing. There are some pieces of evidence that are usually recognizable as not belonging in your home. If they are mouse or rodent droppings, game on. You know, rabbit pellets, I can tell you. There are certain things, termite wings inside a home, yes. There are certain things that we can we can figure out, but not everything may be as clear cut as you would like. So again, things that you might see as as evidence that we might know. Yes, this looks like droppings, but this really is not mouse droppings. That's gecko droppings, okay? But this being mouse droppings, but again. You know, depending on where these are at, if it was, you know, look like really nasty stuff and it was all on a sidewalk, well, is it um, geese? You know, what kind of bird species? Stuff like this. Those are, yes, little German cockroaches on a, an electrical panel. And this, that's a computer electrical panel. So, again, the guys called in to fix something. Oh, there's roaches here. Well, that's probably why something's not working. Again, you're you're at the market, you're somewhere, and you go pick up this, and you notice 
these little white specks and then something like this or some webbing again don't assume somebody might not be aware that what's coming in is being contaminated Oop. these cute little things are paw prints paw prints of of, of rodents this my friends is not dirt from a dirty air filter. This is from rodents dropping down, shimmying down this pipe, shimmying down this pipe, shimmying down another pipe, jumping down to where they were going in a storage room that was storing dog food at an animal shelter. Okay, poorly maintained monitors. I mean, these are great to figure out what's going on, but if they're left there forever, then we don't know what's fresh and what's not. Again, if you're custodial and you see something like that and it looks nasty, pick it up and toss it. And if you see the pest control people say, why are you, they may not know it's there, it might've got moved, whatever, but something like this just tells me nobody cares. So documentation and evaluation. When we're doing monitoring and I am doing something in pest control, knowing the difference, these being the large American cockroaches, well, this could tell me that they're going to problem with door sweeps. Whereas in some of these, these are mostly Germans. There's some uh, other cockroaches here, but this tells me a bigger story. Not only do I have a problem indoors with an indoor established roach, but I've got others who could be praying, could be just opportunities. So monitoring being critical. These are devices. If somebody says, you know, we're going to put out some glue boards and see what's going on. Don't move them. Watch them. See what is on there. Finally, pest prevention can be obtained. So this being the personal residence. This image on the left is when I moved in. And as you can see, there looks like a lot of vegetation. You really cannot see much of what's up against the house. Everything came down. Everything I have put back is not up against this house. What I've done is moved it so that again I can see my foundation that I can watch for activity of different things and just FYI this is how whacked I, I really am because I know I've got a couple of extra minutes I actually have um, a security camera up here I have another security camera here and then I've got two and I've actually got three in the back and part of what I do is, especially with this security camera, either I'm watching for the rats and then there's times of year that I've got Cooper Hawks that live in my neighborhood. I also watch for them, but this is, I mean, part of the, the fun of what I get to do is learn different things. And part of it is I use my own dwelling as a way to, to educate now. For those of you watching, there's there's a couple of things that I am previewing at this point. This first is this new website launch. It's called Pests in the Home. And it is got a variety of information about different pests, but also pest prevention, you know, how to um, hire a pest management provision professional you know and then some simple how-to stuff for your own and if you've got questions about identification we've got answers for you here so this website you can go to get great information for yourself and it's all been research based it's just written in a way that doesn't sound like it's been written by someone who's got a PhD in entomology Second, I am asking you today if you will do me a favor. Either take your cell phone 
and scan this QR code, or if you're allowed to follow this um, link to Qualtrics, myself, um, Dr. Faith Oy from University of Florida, um, Dr. Fudd Graham retired from Auburn University, and I have a survey that talks about pesticides and do-it-yourself pest control around your house. We are looking for information about how you feel about pest control and what's your most important pest. So if you guys could do me a favor, I really, really would appreciate if you could, again, scan the QR code or fill out this link or follow this link and give me your, your, your feedback. And I would like to thank y'all. I am done with at least the presentation part, but I am here to answer questions. Wonderful, that was really, really great. Um, thank you. Um, so if, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I haven't seen any yet, but hopefully we'll have some questions roll in. Um, if not, they can all go find their Valentines. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let's see any questions? One thing I was I was curious about. So you talked about the the total release foggers um, and how they're they're dangerous, and there's other other studies showing that they don't even work. In many cases, the the insects are resistant to them, and or they're not penetrating to the right area. But how do we fix that problem? Because these things are on the shelves and easy, and they look great, and they're affordable, but. It's education, education, education. And, you know, because I think back and I really, really, really do think back when I was your age or Astasia's age and I was, you know, in college for the first time. I mean, you didn't move into a place unless you bombed it so that the bug, you were not going to take over somebody else's bugs. And I think about it now and I'm like, oh my God, no. <laughs> but again, you know, it's also what's there and people taking responsibility and everything else. And it's, there's just so much, but I just wish people would, when you, if you decide you need something, if you're not sure, call somebody that works, that's, that works for the city of New Orleans, that works for Texas A&M, that somebody's got to be here. The National Pesticide Information Center. Any one of us would be happy to help you. Mm -hmm. That's tricky. Yeah, I still don't, I don't see any other questions. Are there any, hopefully someone can type them in or see. If not, like I said, everybody can go take care of their Valentines. <laughs> I think I can copy. I'll put your the survey link in the chat as well, um, just to make that easier. Yeah, Mark, I don't see any more. Oh, here oh, is a question. I think we got one. It okay. says, spoke of the size of rodents, pests, etc., needed to get into a dwelling. What about bats? Funny you should mention that. And darn it, I I've got it packed up but bats especially mexican free tail bats size of your thumb so if i'm a, a bat and i'm migrating generally especially on my roof lines and stuff i tell everybody if i can shove my hand up underneath the flashing that's all a bat really needs But yes, a Mexican free tail bat. If you look at your thumb, they're about that size when their wings are folded up. And Mexican free tails, which are about to start migrating here in the next month from Mexico moving north, when they migrate, they migrate in the hundreds, not in the tens. Other bats are anywhere from about the size of your thumb to no more than mm, maybe two fingers 
and that's being really expansive because most bats, especially in North America, are less than a couple of inches in in length and in di diameter. All right, thank you. I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have a question that comes up, you can email us at education at NOLA.gov. I can forward it to Ms. Janice. Oh, here's a, another uh, question. What is the best way to prevent bed bugs from coming into your home? Um, the best thing is you. So bed bugs just don't wander off a street. It's where you may pick them up. And it's interesting because I've forgotten. Um, we just did a bed bug podcast. It's called Unwanted Guests. Um, but just FYI, bed bugs are hitchhikers. So it's where you may find them. You can pick them up if you were a home health specialist. I mean, going to a client's house. You can find them at a movie theater. They're at hotels. I mean, I knock on wood because every time I travel, I, I look for them and then I'm always thankful I don't bring them home. So it's more you. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, yeah, I never thought of it like that. So that does help. <laughs> helps me. No, it's not like you, you set your bet your book bag down at the bus stop and the bed bugs will come off, off the bench. Now, if you are on the bus and you put your, your backpack down and the bus was infested because nobody ever pays attention to them, then yeah, you could get bed bugs, but hopefully not. Okay, thank you. Now, I don't see anyone typing in the chat, but like I said, if you have a question that comes up and we aren't able to answer it right now, you can email us at educationatnola.gov and I'll forward that to Ms. Janet. Um, just want to thank everyone again for coming, spending an hour and a half with us. Our next webinar is actually on urban rodent control and it is this Thursday from 2 to 3.30, and we'll be talking about more rodent proofing techniques. If you want to join that, you can email us also at education at nola.gov. And with that, I just want to thank everybody once again, and everyone have a good day.